Hello and welcome to another episode of the Top Bin 90 podcast, episode three. We are back in the studio and we've got two of the best Charlotte FC, just MLS minds here today in Brian Bamauer Media. How are you tonight? Doing well, man. I know I'm looking like I'm getting ready to go chop some wood, but I'm here to chop some stats. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And we have our man, Mr. Von Pullman, on tonight. Von, how are you today? Doing great. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing good. First, we got to give a shout out to the QC Royals because the, uh, the drip that they have, man, is nice. Talk to us a little bit about that first. I, want... I mean, QC Royals design their own Icarus kits every single year. Clearly, we had this in the works way before Charlotte FC did on the sea to mountain because it, it's, it's got the, the sea to mountain uh, motif going as well. That was not planned. We had the idea first. So what, you <laughs> 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 so what happens was that it got leaked to Charlotte and Charlotte took your idea. We'll just go with that then. Yeah, there, there is a mole inside of the QC Royals Slack channel for sure. Are y'all looking for some QC royalties? Uh, yeah, there we, go. <laughs> we gotta do like a little drum in yeah. that. <laughs> awesome. So some of the topics that we want to talk on tonight, right? So we're gonna obviously talk about the signing of Leal Abada and the impact. Where do we see him playing? Maybe discuss the the winger battle that we'll probably see on the left now with Yudi and Vargas. Um, maybe uh, we'll also discuss the Vancouver game, the positive start for these first two games for Charlotte. Then we have a subscriber question from Evan. Um, he asks, have the first two games changed our opinion of the year? And is this what a good coach looks like? Um, another question we have is, what are some of the biggest differences we're noticing under Dean Smith? What is the biggest need still in this squad? And then we'll talk a little Toronto. So let's get started. Yesterday, you know, um, I think it was Peter O'Rourke, um, Men came out with the news. He broke that Charlotte is looking to sign Liela Bada. It's officially, unofficially done. Right? He will come in, um, plays as a as a right winger mostly, and um, this is an impactful signing. He's coming in as a YDP. I think it was twenty twenty one PFA Scottish Young Player of the Year, double digit seasons for two seasons in a row. I'll start off with you, Vaughn. What can we expect from a player like this coming into Charlotte? A game changer, a, a guy that opposing teams are going to need to game plan for. They're going to need to uh, take into account every single week. Uh, he's got a lot of weapons that uh, I'd say he has a full bag of tricks. Uh, he, he is going to be a true DP level player. He's going to have that young designated player tag, but he's going to have a little bit of it all. He's direct. Uh, he's good at receiving the ball. He's good in the press. He's pacey. He can send in a cross. He's comfortable making end line runs and hitting cutbacks. He's got a nose for goal. Um, I mean, just there's a lot to be excited about with Lee Alabada. Nice. I love that. In terms of ranking it, right, Brian, you know, we've been in talks with Luciano Rodriguez before, Albert growing back. Do you see him in this level of sphere of players better, slightly less? Like, what are your thoughts there? I mean, I think just in the same range for sure. I mean, I think what Abada brings specifically is that he's played at a really high level in Europe as for well, sure. right? European competition, and he's produced for multiple seasons. The fact that he has 10 plus goals in two straight years, five plus assists. I mean, I don't think Charlotte has signed, at least in the winger position, a player who's contributed um, that recently for their for the club, for a, as big a club as, as he has. So I think that for me, the, the final product being there um, it's more of an established, it's not a project. Like, Abad is not going to yeah. be a project. It's going to be, like, he's not competing for minutes. It's going to be, like, he's going to be expected to come in, get 2,500 to 3,000 minutes, and put up 15-plus goal contributions. Like, that's not only, like, the standard that he's kind of set for himself based on his own production. That's just going to be, like, what kind of the requirement is. And that just hasn't happened or materialized in a signing for Charlotte at the winger position yeah. so far. So And, I mean, like, start, we'll... Uh, dive deeper in this, but that's something that we'll talk about. I mean, with Vargas and Enzo, I think they do things well, but like that final product, I feel like has been missing these first two games. Yep. But in terms of where you guys see him, seeing see him playing, right? He's gonna come in as a right winger. So yeah. now the conversation goes to you know Yuri has come in, has done a great job for Charlotte, scored his first goal. You know, Vargas, we're expecting a big season from him, right? One of the things Dean mentioned in his last presser 
was that he played Vargas on that right wing because he liked being him more direct. But I think um, you have may, may have mentioned it where, you know, he's more effective on the left wing, right? So when it comes to that positional battle um, between Yuri and Vargas, what are some of the things that you guys are seeing there? It's going to be a position battle. I think all of us had Vargas written in as mm -hmm. the left winger. For sure. Yep. Like, to, until two weeks ago, yep. yeah. we weren't talking about Yuri. We, we were hoping he'd make the team. We saw that there was that potential from his crown legacy time. Um, but I think we have a real position battle on our hands right there because Yuri has shown that he's got it, that he can hold his own at this level. Um, but we also haven't seen play go through him a lot. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's going to be really interesting with Abada and when Vargas is at that left wing spot is we're going to see opportunities for us to have play going down both flanks. And that's something we haven't seen a lot through these first two games. And I think that's largely by design. I think uh, that's the reason that Vargas was starting on the right wing is because Dean wants to have that direct play and trust Vargas's abilities in that. But in terms of goal scoring, it's not even close for what Vargas can do on the right versus on the left. Um, in fact, that assist that he had uh, in this last game, that was Vargas's, or, or in, the, uh, in the opener, that was his first assist as a right winger. All of his goal contributions last year were from the left wing. So we, we've we seen it. Like the eye test back and the stats align on Vargas being more effective on the left wing. Yeah, here, here's, a, here's a quick stat for you. When he's played at the as a left winger, 13 games, five goal contribution, five goals to assist. Right winger, like you mentioned, seven games, one assist. Right? So, I mean, it's like you mentioned, it's night and day. Yeah. Well, and Yuri Tav Tavaj, I mean, that's the other thing is like, he had 12 goals and three assists at Crown Legacy. The bulk of that was when he was at the wing. At the wing, he had uh, six goals, one assist. So granted, that's at the second tier level, uh, but we've seen him already find the score sheet. He's been involved in both goals early on in the year. So yeah, who's going to earn those minutes? Who's going to be the guy that you know rises to the top? Uh, and and uh, it's it's great for us to finally have some options. When yeah, for that. sure. I was going to say, I mean, we always... I mean, obviously, we see signings from Crown to Charlotte FC this year, but, you know, our expectations is, well, how good can these guys be at the top level? Yeah. And I think Yuri has come in and made just an impact from the get-go, right? I mean, he's been involved in both of the goals that we've scored yeah. so far in this season. Yeah, and I think also between both Vargas and Tavares, you also have different styles of play, so there's also options in that regard. Like Dean can pick different style of player for that left wing position because Tavares seems to be way uh, have a nose for finding the ball around the box. He also seems to like, I mean, on the header on the first on the first goal in the first in the opener. I mean, just using his frame to find a way to get his head on the ball, right? And then in the second one, he's just, I mean, wide open in space. But, I mean, it just seems like he has a knack for kind of finding and crashing into the box. I don't feel like that's Vargas's game really at all. He is way better with the ball near the top of the box and kind of playing around with it and, like, finding a way to cut inside, make that cross or make that pass or, or shoot from range. So you have two different styles of winger as well in terms of just what you that's can do. Point. So I think that also plays a role. Now, I also think... Just because of how, I mean, I don't think this is immediately a part of the conversation in, in terms of competition, but I mean, Nymphasha, I think, also deserves to be mentioned just in terms of the fact how often Dean talks about him and yeah. the fact that he's, li I mean, it's definitely on his mind about giving him a start. It's like nagging at him, it seems like, at times. And so I think that also, maybe not immediately, but down the road, I mean, he's clearly, I mean, he got five minutes in the first game, got 10 minutes this last game. It seems like Dean is kind of, warming that engine up to see what you know when is the right time to kind of give him a shot and that is a massive thing about Liel Abada as well is now you're going to have Berkimas being able to train alongside mm. a guy like Abada I don't underestimate what that means and and if Berkimas gets those opportunities and he's scoring goals the people the same people that are scouting Abada in Europe yeah. are also going to be having their eyes on Nymphasha and I think that it is something that is going to elevate everyone around them like bringing in that level of player is important also for the development for the eyes for all of that for the rest of the organization so no the the, the team the organization they're executing a plan uh, i think it's something that we should not lose sight of and take for granted that abada's move also the dollar figure like it is such a good sign that we're yeah, playing sure. that type of ball game yeah, for sure. I mean, MLS in general, I mean, is spending way more now, which is great. I mean, the competition just keeps getting stronger and better, 
which ultimately will lead to a better product on the field, which is great, you know. In terms of Abada, I mean, with the situation that he's faced at Celtic, how much can you expect from him from the get-go, right? I mean, obviously, like, I take a lot of these articles that I read, I take with a grain of salt because some of these journalists, I feel like, are way more opinionated than they need to be in some of these articles when we're trying to find facts, right? So, I mean, obviously, it's a delicate situation, right? But in terms of mentality and coming in here, what are you guys seeing there? How impactful can he be from the get-go? I mean, he's stepping in to what appears to be a good environment. Uh, I think he's needing that change of environment. And, and uh, I think having that opportunity to be the guy, I think he, he's going to be able to respond well to. Like For he, sure. He's handled pressure at, at Celtic. He's played Champions League. Like yeah. He's going to be able to step into MLS. And I think that that's not going to be an intimidation factor. He's young, though. He's, he's 22, um, but this is a guy that he's already got four seasons under his belt with yeah. 10 plus goal contributions. Like he's moved away it's from solid, home. Yeah. Like I, I think he's going to be fine in adjusting to that. Probably the part that's the bigger question is the physicality of MLS. Mm. There's a lot of people that underestimate that physicality and, and that's gonna be something that's very different for him, you know, and travel. Yeah. His travel within Israel and his travel within Scotland yeah. is incredibly different from what he's going to face uh, every single week in MLS. Um, and, and for a guy 22, that far away from home, um, I, there's going to be an adjustment. There's going to be an acclimation, how he handles it. Uh, I get the sense he's a very mature 22, uh, but we'll have to see how that plays out. I think one other thing is just the Scottish Premier League is just like – like there's two clubs in that league, and then there's kind of like a huge, everybody the, else the, the ridiculous gap between yeah. Rangers and Celtic, and and everybody else is alarming. I you know it's so different that it's so different than MLS. So like I think there is there that could also be a factor just in terms of like on most days there's like huge huge favorites, and then having to come into every single matchup is going to be kind of like, uh, you know, a, a dogfight. And so like, I think that's also, that plays a role as well, just in terms of like how quickly can he adjust to that? Whereas like, I mean, half the season in Scotland, you're kind of like kind of taking a day off, to be honest. Like if you're for one of those big clubs, just because you can yeah. handle most and of you the can competition there. Kind of like stat pad a little bit too. A hundred percent. You know? A hundred percent. So... There's uh, a little bit of a waiting there as well, yeah. For sure, but, like, I I really like Vaughn's point about, like, you know, like, the pr from a pressure standpoint, yep. it's totally different here, right? Yep. Um, and in terms of w how this league is versus the Scottish Premier League, but, like, what you guys are mentioning, I think immediate impact is something that we can see from a player like this. So two weeks ago, we were like, yo, who's starting at right wing, right? We barely have... Enzo and Vargas. Now we've got winger competition. We've got a player coming in that's quality. So not only that, but it's been a positive start to the season. You know, I'm very surprised at how well we've started the season, especially I really the first half against Vancouver, how Dean's first away game, how this team just imposed themselves from the get-go. And so let's talk a little bit about this game. Uh, maybe Vaughn, talk to us about some of your thoughts on on this Vancouver game specifically. I, I was surprised by how much possession we had early yeah. on, and some of it was also how Vancouver approached the game. Uh, I was expecting them to press us, to to make things difficult and challenge us on the ball, and they just sat in a flat line and were like, "You can have the ball," and we handled that really well. Uh, we could have been a little more goal dangerous. I think it took us some work to to get those goal scoring chances um but but we grew into the half uh we stuck with our game plan uh and we found ways to get some opportunities on goal I, I think quite frankly it was probably enzo capetti's best game in, in a charlotte fc shirt yeah um, it, the, the we'll, final we'll product talk about wasn't that, there yeah. like there's room for improvement in the final third uh, team wide um this but, is but what I saw some good stuff just to interrupt you this is like i mean <laughs> People will focus on that chance he missed and fair, right? But like, I agree with you. I mean, what Enzo does on and off the ball is ridiculously yeah. good, right? I mean, even the dummy for the first goal. But like we mentioned, and that's something that we need a guy like Abada to bring, right? That like we need like your your DP striker 
and your wingers that are U22s, YDPs have to have goal contributions. And that's something that we need more of from Vargas and also Enzo. Enzo, to a degree, like you said, I thought he had a great game. But what people are going to focus on is the 1v1 miss, right? I think the other thing that Abada coming in, like seeing this this game specifically, I feel like Capetti won almost every like launched long ball when it was a 1v1 over the top and you have him and one defender, he almost always won the race to the ball. Right. And I feel like if you're a Bada with pace who can run in behind, you see that as like a really good opportunity to get in behind because then Capetti can get the ball, win it, and then he can set you up to get in behind after that with the overlapping run. And so I feel like that for me is like, that's what maybe it was is missing to Capetti's game in some ways because he can win the ball when you get a, you know in those 1v1 situations, those 50-50 situations, but does he have the attacker to run in behind to kind of like so he can then set up that attack for other yeah, players? Yeah, I think as that's well. one one great thing you see from Abada too. A lot of the goals that I've saw him score, like some of the highlights, this is great positioning. He knows where to be at yeah. the right time. Yep. And that was the thing that I was watching in Capetti's game, and that it felt like Ross and Club Capetti again. Like all of the film I watched for him at Ross and Club, like all of a sudden you were seeing him win those. 50-50s, win those one-on-ones. I think there was one time where it was uh, Tristan Blackman even won the header. It was like a three-on-one situation, yeah. and Capetti still found a way to come down with the ball, hold possession, w- wait for his play, his teammates to come into the play. He was clean on his touch, on turf, something that we've seen him struggle with. That's a with. good point, yeah. I, he was making those strong runs. He forced the turnover that gave him that breakaway opportunity. Yep. Like... The confidence level is there. Recognizing his, uh, you know, back shoulder and making that dummy, that is n- a high level intelligent play, yeah. and he absolutely meant to do that. Um, and, and and we see in that situation, you have him being fed. Like, yeah. finally, there was an opportunity where Diagre actually was getting the ball into Capetti, and he let it play through. But like, that's what we've been missing. Like, he's been on this island. And I, I see the signs that that is going to be very different moving forward in Dean Smith's system. For sure. I mean, the goal we conceded, you know, reminded me of last year slightly, right? Although it was the first half, you know, ter- like a set piece goal. Yeah. Kalina, I think, tries to anticipate the play, right, and gets found out, right? I mean, from that first half, and I think Dean mentioned it in his presser too, like it felt like we should have went in, we should have got all three points, right? Yeah. In the but first half, he felt like they could have like locked for it in sure, right for sure. There in the first right. Half. I mean that one v one Enzo miss. Yep. Um, uh, the the VAR decision. I mean, arguably, we should have had the PK there too. <laughs> yes and no. If yeah. that was against us, we would all ride it. Like that's not a pen. It was a soft yeah. call, but there was nothing there was clear and obvious to to switch it. Like once it was that's called, a fair point. There's no yeah. reason for that call to be reversed. It should have yeah. never gone to the, to the monitor. Would it have been a soft call? Yeah, but that happens in in soccer. Um, you know, it it didn't go our way, and and that's probably why the result didn't go our way. Um, there there were opportunities there, and then the goal we conceded. It was just it was too soft. It was indiv- indiv- two individual errors, in my opinion. For sure, and I mean, two games now, four points, right? Even with four points, I mean, we're still. You know, technically seventh in the East, right? So it just shows you how strong this conference is. And even with a positive start, it's still going to be a difficult climb, right? But what are some of the things, maybe the biggest differences you guys are noticing under D- Dean Smith just from these first two games? Well, I mean, they've gotten points out of their first couple of games, which is, I mean, so they're just. <laughs> Last they're, year we were at zero, right? <laughs> and so they're not behind the ball. I mean, that's a huge difference. If you don't get any points out of your first three games like they did the last two years, I mean, you just, you're not, I mean, they go from having to be climbing the table and catching up five, six, seven points to now you're right in the thick of it out of the gate. So, like, they have the wiggle room. They already, four points was kind of like my target for them through both the home game and the three road games. If they could get four points out of that stretch and come back home and play, like, even on points, one point per game average, I was fine with that. So they're already at this point for me through this stretch playing with house money. Um, I've been very impressed with the fact that uh, Dean seems willing to sacrifice style for substance at times to help just make sure he gets the result, which is what was missing a lot of the times. I feel like both with Mar and Latanzio, maybe that just comes with the inexperience in coaching and really wanting to like establish themselves 
as having a style, as having a, a new, like establishing the, themselves as having, having a style as a new coach. Dean doesn't seem to be concerned about that at all. He's like, look, I can come in and get a job done. And that's what it looks like so far. It looks like at times they have a nice style to their play, but at some times he's willing to just like, like the second half against Vancouver, it got scrappy. It got a little ugly, right? It was not pretty, but they like were able to lock it down and keep the draw, which I think for me, that was a sign of, you know, uh, that it, that impressed me. Yeah, and I think I think it also talks to the experience. You know, yeah. having a manager with experience yeah. versus guys like Miguel and Latanza. Like, Dean's didn't get the best hand to start his year at Charlotte, but at the end of the day, he's like, this is from his perspective, he's like this isn't the worst I've ever seen. No, think right? about it. He I mean, he said in the presser after the home opener, he said my first game when I coached for Leicester City during a relegation yeah. battle was Man City away. <laughs> <laughs> right sure. so like the difference in level of that experience and the pressure of that situation from then to now is just night and day for sure right? and so there's just a we're, as a fan base yeah. we're freaking out we don't have a winger right yeah. he's like bro i i had to go man city yeah. away well, right. and they're like keep us up <laughs> <laughs> well what i like is I, i've seen us playing very compact and organized that those have been the hot words yep but yep. i think also very mature like, mm. like the team by design has brought in these veteran leaders and guys that, that are stepping into that role. But like, where have we had a lot of stability right now? Um, you have Westwood and Urso that have been fantastic yep. in that pivot together. And you heard that it was like, hey, when did we start kind of moving away from what was working? It was when we were bypassing our, our pivot. And, and Dean called that out. So he recognizes how key uh, that, that mature comfort in the midfield is for the club and you have uh urnan out there you've got burn out there you've got diagra you have kalina who's been here you know we talk about mls experience we got guys that have some of that mls experience just from being on the squad now and so i'm just seeing a very mature performance from everyone like it's rubbing off on everyone we're able to do some of that same playing around with positions and and tactics and seeing some of those in-game adjustments you know we're we're in a 4-3-3 Often in the first half, we're defending in that 4-4-2 where it's Copetti and Diagre that are going up and doing that that press. Uh, but then we've been shifting at halftime a lot. I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, we're going into more of like a 4-3-3 defensively at times. So I'm seeing those in-game adjustments. I'm seeing the personnel where we saw a little bit of that two-striker system. Like yep. we, we got to finally have that opportunity of Copetti and Ajimong on the pitch at the right. same time. We're going to want to see more of it. Obviously, it didn't bear fruit in that little sample size we got. But, like, Dean is attempting some of those things and not doing it at the expense of leaving the team stretched and vulnerable in the back. And I think that's – I think the players understand their roles and where they fit and what they're trying to do and that those tactical switches can change and not at the expense of leaving us vulnerable. For yeah. sure. How concerned would you be, though, with, you know, our midfield – I mean, 34 junior or so, 33 Ashley Westwood, I think 32 Brecht, right? Like, how can we expect a solid 34 games from these guys? I don't think the expectation is that many of them are going to be playing 34 games. Like, that's that's part of it is, like, Bronico is going to come back at some point. We have a guy that's got 3,000-minute yeah. legs on him. Uh, Petkovic. Pe Petkovic is going to get into the mix at some point. At some point, Bender's going to come back healthy. We've got this opportunity in the summer for U22s and and uh, you know another designated player. If that ends up being you know the Albert Grunbeck style playmaking midfielder, well then that's going to be entered into the mix as well. You ha still have our field that's going to have opportunities for minutes. Like we have a lot of like MLS good guys and still having the roster flexibility to address that. Like if we get, have a, a case of the injury bug, like I feel confident in our number twos and number threes in the midfield, which like. Guys, we are not that far removed from our midfield being Brant Bronico, uh, Ben Bender, and Quinn McNeil. Like, we have come a long way in what we're doing here. So I feel it's in a good spot. And and age, you know, Urso and, and Westwood and, oh, they're 34. It doesn't matter. We, we only need them to play 1,500 to 2,000 minutes. They've got that in their legs. No doubt about it. I think one other thing, and this kind of touches on the, the age that we're talking about now, but also just... Uh, what we were talking about before in terms of, of his style of play. I think the one thing that Dean has done well is figuring out just how to play those midfielders to maximize their ability best. Westwood specifically, 
the fact that he's like willing to do the double pivot instead of having Urso and or Westwood, one of them kind of being the sixth solo and having to do maybe the the extra running and just letting like them both kind of play to their strengths, which for me, Westwood, just because of how well he can do everything, positioning, creative passing, all of it, to have him in a single pivot kind of just limits him to one style of play. And I feel like in the double pivot, it maximizes that. And then also maybe it takes a little bit of the pressure off in terms of some of the defending because you've got two guys back there backing each other up. So I think Dean has found a solution to maybe some of the, the aged midfielders in terms of just being able to use them to their strengths and ways to kind of like counteract that as well. And, and I didn't even mention Diani. <laughs> like that's a whole other yeah, wrinkle. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. like, like, no, we, we have plenty of options in midfield. What, what we maybe are still lacking is the playmaker. Yeah, it, it, it's for the, sure. Can, do we have that guy that can provide 10 assists from midfield? Can he connect those lines and, and can he find those line breaking passes? Well, I think that's what we're kind of expecting from a guy like Brecht right now, right? And I mean... I don't think he had his best game against Vancouver, but I mean, he still put up an assist, which is important. Um, I think something also that you can add that maybe is not on a tactical standpoint, but you know how comfortable these players are with a guy like Dean Smith. I think that goes a long way, right? I mean, we're seeing a different Adilson Melanda this year versus who we saw last year. I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, Having a guy of experience like Dean Smith, who when you talk to a lot of different players, they just say it's just so different now. You know, I mean, they it's not like they don't want to bash what it was before, but they're they're giving you clues as to like how much more comfortable they are. And I think that that is a very important piece that maybe doesn't get talked about often when it comes to, you know, the tactical side of the game. Well, it's the player psyche, too. Like yeah, the for sure. psychology side of it. A year ago this time, we were two games into a season where we were still memorializing Anton. Yeah. So we, we had a full preseason. Uh, I, I think that we are finally, like, my wish and dream for this year is that we have our first year of normalcy. Like, mm -hmm. expansion year is its own beast. Last year, we, we don't need to rehash all of it. We know that it was not a normal season. It feels like this year everything is aligning to go down that. That's a great point, actually. That right road. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you had like, I mean, none of those players experienced a death before, right? Then you had these allegations, right? So it was just a great inaugural season, like you mentioned, is just. Well, and we're talking about yeah. for Melanda. Like, Melanda was 21 years old and being asked to lead the back line. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, and, and having a mix of guys play beside him. You know, Bill comes in and, and, and Bill's that veteran leader, but he's stepping into a, a near impossible situation. He's moving halfway across the country. He's got all these expectations on him to fill those shoes. And then playing with a midfielder at left back for multiple games. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and then, great, Privet comes in and is that calming presence, uh, and we're seeing it continue this year, but, like, he's not a natural left center back. For sure. He's filling the role. He's doing great. But also at the same point in time, the team's still saying and acknowledging, yeah, we probably want to still upgrade at left center back. Like, I'm sure he hears some of that. Yeah. Right? So so like there there's still some of that sports psychology stuff going on, but we're seeing those signs that we're playing with confidence, we're playing with a clear identity, clear structure, clear trust. I think the players, the locker room seems to trust one another. For sure. And that's huge. Yeah, Melanda specifically in the in the post match press conference after Vancouver seemed very con like just the way his poise was like he was very yeah. confident he even pushed back on me because i was like man it sounds like y'all were very frustrated with this one one result whereas like it i mean for me personally it seemed like i would i would have taken that draw on the road in vancouver with the travel vancouver's a good team they're not a bad i mean they're a yeah. good team i like a lot of their players on that team so the fact that Milanda kind of pushed back on me, he was like, "Yeah, but we we should have we should have done these things. We should have won. We had the opportunity to put up more goals. We gave up kind of a cheap goal, and, and so he was just he pushed back on me a lot more than I would think he has in past interviews and past times we've talked to yeah. him. Yeah, he seemed like there's he was, a difference. He was a there's a more, difference aura about him. Yeah. Like in press, even after the first game, the same thing where, yeah. like you know, I was like, "Hey, like you don't seem like too excited about this. He's like we got to keep moving. Like yeah. I like that. I mean, we you need that, and that's that comes." from the inside right and it's yeah. important to have a guy like that and i mean that's like you mentioned the veterans it's so important to have people that have been there done that like okay like you know even from the get-go some of the mls pundits are ready writing the team off i'm sure half of them have changed their minds maybe in terms of what what they're seeing from charlotte i'm gonna say the the silent thing out loud i think that the players and 
people around the team had confidence last year that they had a higher ceiling. Yeah. I, I think that one of the reasons Latanzio is gone, and we heard it, for sure, w- was that the players felt that they were being held back and that there was some level of a higher ceiling. And so I think we're also seeing that air of confidence. Mm-hmm. I think we see these guys, they believe in themselves. They say, nah, screw that. A 1-1 draw on the road, that should have been a win. We were the better team. We should have punished them. We should have put them away. And the expectation is, no, we, home away, doesn't traveling the longest distance we could, does not matter. No excuses. Go out there, raise the expectation, let's get the win. We haven't had that opportunity these past two years to raise the expectation. I think there's members of the fan base that have had that. You know, there's, there are those lofty goals. But I think now the players truly believe they're like, no, you don't understand what's happening behind closed doors. And we can perform to a higher level. You're telling us that we're, we're a bubble team or, or below it. No, we, we, we can be a contender. And that they believe that and that they're playing the way that they are. Yeah, you stay defensively sound and you make these additions and you add to it, sky's the limit. There, there's no reason we can't be in the mix for, for trophies. And, and I think the players are showing that they believe that. Those are fair points. And also, like, the consistency, right? I mean, really, it's only two games in, but yeah. still, we've already saw the same lineup back-to-back, which, yeah. I mean, last season, how often did we see that? Maybe t- two or three times, yeah. right? So This is easily the longest stretch we've had a center-back pairing in, in yeah, the, from last yes. year, from Leagues Cup to now, it's I mean by far and away over the last couple of years the longest center back pairing. For sure. All right, let's get into the subscriber question real quickly uh, from Evan. He he mentioned um, have the first two games changed our opinion of this year? So first, let's start because we we haven't heard from you at least on our podcast right where you expected this team. Me. From the get-go, I said, what, 8th through 13th is where I saw this team playing at. Brian, I think you mentioned 9th you were solidifying, right? That was I, my prediction. Yeah, I said 9th as well. Vaughn, kind of give us your perspective, Vaughn. I think you were a little bit more positive on the outlook. And you're, to be fair, right now you're being proven right, right? It's still a long season, a long season. right? Uh, I, I was saying that I felt the team's ceiling was like 6th, floor was like 10th. Uh-huh. Uh, I think in my official, like when I finally was like, hey, let's take a look at the East and see where we really fall. I l- had us at seventh after, you know, Swiderski was gone. Like this is like right before first kick. Um, I think the addition of Abada, uh, the flexibility, what we can add in the summer, the way we're looking organized, you know, defensively, um, I-, I think our ceiling is is rising. It's still going to be very challenging to move up the mm-hmm. conference. Uh, it- it's just an absolute gauntlet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but also that's a perfect word to say gauntlet but, but, of a of a. But the East is going to also be beating up on themselves. You know, there, these really good teams are going to be squaring off against really good teams, and yeah. so there's going to be a a certain leveling out. Uh, I'm I'm really curious to see when we get to that home stretch when we go up against Cincinnati and Columbus, how we pair up there, because um, that that's going to be I think a better measuring stick. Uh, Vancouver was a good first measuring stick. Vancouver is a good MLS squad. Uh, Toronto, we see them coming up, but. But this is a former wooden spoon team. Like I'm, I'm not going to draw a lot of conclusions. And if we go out there and and beat them, like I'm not going to all of a sudden be like, oh, th- th- this is the truth. Uh, we, we've got to see us beat some of those playoff level teams. Um, and, and once again, I think that confidence can carry us. Where, yeah, my expectations changed a little bit because I, I those dominoes are starting to fall. We we are getting that <laughs> DP. Uh, we've seen that we've locked things down defensively. Um, I think that that our ceiling can go up to third, fourth. Well, I'm, I mean, and I, I've, Vaughn, we've had this conversation since the end of the season. I, I said at the time, probably cautiously optimistic, like overall is, and that's why I, I went with ninth. I would say I'm still like in that, in that ballpark. The results have been like solid, exactly what you want. You can't ask for more at this point. You win your home games, you draw your road games and you're a supporter shield contender. Right. So, so far, that's I mean, that's they're doing the things they need to be doing now. Like you said, I mean, the East is an absolute gauntlet. There's at least seven teams that I would still like just for sure. roster health. A lot of these Eastern Conference teams that are like so the bo- the teams that aren't performing well are all going to be near the top by the end. Right. Yeah. The bottom of the East right now is like New England, get Orlando, Orlando yep. Nashville. Yep. Right. So, so let's just teams, look at the top five right now. Inter Miami, yeah. you know, with seven points. Right. Mm-hmm. DC United. I mean, from DC to uh, Toronto, it's all four. But I mean, 
DC United, right? I mean, we're not, we weren't expecting. I mean, at least I wasn't yeah. for them to have a great start. I mean, New York Red Bulls has done well. Montreal four points as well. Charlotte four points. Toronto. I mean, these are teams that last year were struggling, right? Yeah. Versus they've had a very positive start to the season, which is where I'm I'm at with you. Where like, okay, I could I could see us finishing seventh, but I still feel comfortable at ninth. You know, there's still a lot a yeah, lot, a of, lot of soccer to be played, right? A lot of it, like. I mean, I don't think Miami is as good as they're playing, and I think that was an outlier. Orlando is definitely not up to snuff yet, but they also yeah. didn't. They weren't where they were. They, they Orlando started slow last year, and then were the hottest team in all of MLS by the end of last season, right? So there's just going to be a lot of interchange. I, Yeah, I think eighth or ninth is still well within, like, a reasonable range for now. I mean, ceiling could be higher for sure. I mean, they still have some questions to be answered. Capetti definitely has to find goals. Like that has to, I mean that just has yeah. to happen. I think That's him what and, the standard is. And I think him and Vargas. Vargas yep. in terms of at least contributing, right? Yep. About it too. I, I, I said this in, in my preseason, you know, talks with people is like losing Swiderski, Yuzviak, and Maram. That was like eighteen goals, fifteen assists. Right. Thirty three goal contributions. Yeah. Right. So the question is, can Vargas, Yuri Tavaj, Leah Labada, a, a full season of Diagra, like, can those guys make up the difference on that? Yeah. And I believe that they can. Like, right now, 33 it's goals. That's a fair that's, argument. That's, yeah. that's, that's a goal per game average. Right now, the Diagra assist to uh, Tavares, we're at two goal contributions. Like, we're averaging one per game. Like, we're on that track without those additions of mystery future DP, Abada, uh, getting these other guys added into the squad and, like, I, I think it's going to come. I think it's going to be fine. The the way the lens I'm looking at it through is like, yeah, the past two years we lost our first three games. We are already at four points. Yep. So if we play exactly to the level that we did last year, exactly to the level, that was 43 points. Yep. 43 plus four, we're on a 47-point pace. And I think we're a better team than we were a year ago. Definitely defensively, it, it's going to carry over. The, the question that really is going to come into the mix is, yeah, how quickly do some of those new pieces integrate? And uh, what type of adversity do the other teams and, and ourselves yeah. face throughout the year? Like, yeah. guys are going to get hurt. Yep. Injuries are going to happen. There's going to be messy locker rooms. Yeah. There's going to be coaching changes. Like, there's going to be stuff that hits the fan. Um, and, and it's going to be the teams that can avoid a lot of that adversity, overcome it, whatever, that, that kind of elevate. So, yeah, that's where I'm at, where, like, how good can Montreal really be this year? Or D.C. or Inter-Miami, for that matter. For teams that maybe were, like, right outside of it. That now could be in the mix, right? That's that's where we're at. That's where I'm kind of basing. You know, I've there will be two or three teams in that top seven, eight last year that will drop off, but who's gonna replace them, right? And I mean, I feel like we're in the mix. I just don't know how much in the mix we can actually be. But that's the beautiful thing about MLS as well. You know, I mean, like Cincy three years ago was a totally different team. Yeah. Yep. I think one other thing that really stands out, not only in Charlotte, but all of the Eastern Conference right now, is all the new coaching hires are performing like pretty well for the most part. Like Courtois yeah. in Montreal, uh, Herdman in Toronto. Like I'm, Tor So specifically, I mean, I guess we can talk a little, a little bit more about Toronto as, the mat as we get to the matchup portion. But, I mean, they were the biggest underdogs for both of their matchups, week one and week two, and then they got a result. So, like... There, a lot of these new coaches are coming in and, and finding results early. So Baby I think, Florida's dog. Right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I keep going, sorry. No, so I think that's, I mean, right? So I think that's another variability, both for Dean Smith and for all these new coaches. At some point, there's going to be a streak of poor results. That's just what yeah. happens in a season. How do you get your team to respond to for that? For sure. And then I think yeah. those are really going to be for a lot, because there's so many new coaches, new cultures, new teams yeah. in the East, I, especially the, bu the bubble teams. And like, how, who rises up through that? I think those are the teams that are then getting yeah. to that seventh, eighth, ninth spot. And I think that's where that where that experience that Dean brings, like we've yeah. mentioned, is really going to help out. That yeah. Ted Lasso effect, bruh. <laughs> Believe. <laughs> All right, I, I'm going to reserve my next. Moving on to the next question. <laughs> we've had a great pod so far, bro. Yeah. Why you got to bring that up? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I did, did, did it for the fans. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so obviously uh adding a guy like Abada, right? We solved that right wing issue, right? What do you still see as a big need in this squad? And I guess I'll start off with you, Brian. 
I think it, is it the left center back? Is it the ten? Is it the what? See, I've I've been fine with honestly the center back pairing this whole up through the preseason. I I honestly thought the attack was the base, especially when Swiderski and Yuzviak were gone. I mean, you have to address the goals and the for lack sure. of goals. And so for me, I still would add more attacking midfield help. I mean, not necessarily that the Yahere isn't enough. But it's just you got to compete. Right now, it looks like Diahare has the legs well over what our field can produce 90-minute-wise. And so you just got to have somebody else there to kind of push each other. It's just like how every position has to be. you got to have that that pusher. And so I think that's where I would address. I mean, I, it's hard to have too many midfielders, especially on the creative side of things, especially with how MLS works where there's just so many standout midfielders who show up and get 15, 20 goal con you know, con contributions a season. So it's just something that I think Charlotte could still easily need to, like, just need to address. Privet, for me, has done enough to keep the starting job at left center back. And, I mean, when it comes to defensive, building a, a back line in MLS, if you find a super draft pick that can actually start in MLS, it's such a huge hit and a huge value. I mean, that's what Philadelphia did. I mean, Elliott is a third-round super draft pick, and Blake is a super draft pick, right? So they just, they build a back line, on on value on super draft picks and i think if you can do that or find that hit you just it, what it does to the rest of your roster is just i mean it's magnitudes you can do so much more with the rest of your your roster si and signings and stuff like that it just for me it's almost if you can perform at a starting caliber level for a whole season that's a huge win in and of itself and so i'm willing to kind of ride that for a bit um, and see if that you know pans out because what privet what privet starting can do if he can compete he opens up so many other doors for your ability to address other positionings both now and moving forward fair yeah for me it's the playmaking 10. It, yeah mls is the I league of the 10. Yeah. i think that's what sasha cluster was saying um you, you know I, when he was a what was he on he was on the charlotte soccer show and he was talking about that you, you know i i think um if Diagre went down right now, we are really susceptible. Yeah. Like he's the closest yeah. thing we've got to that playmaking number 10. Um, a guy that can make the line-breaking passes, that uh, can be a focal point in the attack, uh, that, that play goes through. I have a lot of faith in the technical ability of Diagre, but like he still has – he doesn't have that 20-goal contribution pedigree. Um, you know, if, if we had that Mukhtar, Heel – uh, Lucho Acosta, like we would be talking about this team. Like, there's no reason we can't be a cup contender for sure. Like, yeah. like literally, yeah. if we had that guy, yeah. Like, if we had that guy, everything. even with all the things we were experiencing before, like all the anomalies, I would, I would, I would rate us higher than I do right now. But that's so you make a great point. Like, there's nobody still on this team that I feel like can put the team on their back and, like, take us to the promised land, and you need that. And I'm saying that with the knowledge of Abada coming. Like, I'm saying an attack of Abada, Capetti, uh, you know, a, a hybrid between uh, Tavares and Vargas with a number 10 of that level underneath them at, and connecting that with, you know, Westwood and Urso and or whoever else is playing in that pivot there, there's a lot to like. And, and I think that's the thing is, like, there's a clear vision and a clear path to us taking that big jump in the league. That's that's why I'm still saying third or fourth in the league. Like I've seen this play out with the Seattle Sounders of the past. Listen, if if we finish third or fourth, we're clipping this and posting it like every day. <laughs> Cuz that I mean, you make fair points. And, and, and Don't it, get me wrong, you make fair points. And like a year ago, we were we were at 50 four 55 goals conceded yeah but like that was us also like leaking heavily at the beginning yeah and scaling it back like to me this team if we can be in that 35 to 43 goals conceded yeah. and it from the early returns it looks like we can be that and we can get the the attack getting some positive progression uh, yeah i mean st just st st louis did not look like a team that was going to win the west yeah Right. The, even even still today, like a system, a, a style coach, a belief system, the right vibes can carry an MLS team a really long way. Yeah. And and we have all those ingredients and, and I can see the vision of how it's falling in place. And just just to add to what you said, I mean, uh, Seattle finished second in the West last season and they only had 32 goals against them. So, I mean, that compared to 55, like you said, 
take down 10 or 15 goals were were, were definitely up. And there. their attack and, wasn't very good. Yeah. Like, they did not score many for goals. For sure. And and it's a lot. Like, like that's a big correction, like, year to year. But I see no reason that we can't be making that. Like, we have a stable back line. We have guys that are acclimated and in the roster. Um, I, I just see the vision of it. Yeah, for sure. I think we're all in agreement. I, I feel like we're good. It's good enough at left center back right now, right? Yeah. The, that 10, that creative role is what we truly need. All right, and then lastly, let's talk about heading into Toronto. I mean, third game for these boys under Dean Smith, undefeated in MLS, right? I mean, Toronto, like you've mentioned, has surprised everybody as well. They've gotten two really good results to start off their season. What What are you expecting this game, Brian? I mean, this is this comes down to whether or not I mean Charlotte can really just keep doing what they're doing and getting the result on the road in the spot where they've like historically not been able to perform well, right? But that's what Dean Smith has has really, I think more than anything, has changed. He got the win in the home opener. He got the goal in the home opener that the team had been lacking. It's fair. He got a point on the road on a huge, really long road trip, which I, I don't think they, like for that really long West Coast trip, well, yeah. no, they, beat, they beat Galaxy 1-0. But I mean, they got like just beat down by LAFC 5-0 when they went out West. They got beat by Seattle when they went out West in both in 2022. Um, so it's just that West Coast trip is tough, and he was able to get the point out of that game as well. So I think, can he continue to change that vibe in terms of like a place where historically he get, they did not yeah. play well? Can he both stop Bernadeschi? From That's what I was ball? just about to say. I was like, Bernadeschi must yeah. be licking his lips like my favorite yeah. team. Yeah right. <laughs> yeah, right. So, well, actually, I think Lorenzo Insigne has been the one who, for me, has been performing a little bit better this year but again Bernadeschi is yeah he's he's, His goal he's Charlotte he's Charlotte's uh, uh Achilles heel for sure out of Toronto so I think that's the thing can he you know lock him up in terms of just defending him well and can he also get at least a point out of that road trip we got a point from Toronto last year on the road but can they do it again and I think that's that's a big I mean it's a big factor because I mean this is one of those bubble teams right now right they're they're overperforming in terms of kind of where their expectations were based on where they were at the end of last year they got, you know, they got two big results for them. Both teams are going to be coming in flying pretty high and feeling confident yeah. about where they're at with their new coach and their new culture. Now that they're meeting, you know, where, you know, where does the rubber meet the road? Yeah. Vaughn, how much um, in terms of, of a factor was New England throwing that stupid Toronto box? <laughs> 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 it, it was huge. It, <laughs> <laughs> they, they jinxed the entire game. <laughs> All the bad juju from that. That was hilarious. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right, getting back to it, uh, what uh, what do you see heading into Toronto? Something's going to give. Uh, Toronto has had back-to-back clean sheets to start their season. Yep. Uh, Sean Johnson has kind of stood on his head for those two games, like getting a lot of saves. I think he had yeah. six saves against New England. Um, you know, last minute – one yesterday too that was phenomenal yeah and and then for us you know we've opened up the scoring in both games so uh, are we going to be able to break the seal i mean can't win if you don't break the seal um could be another clean sheet we could end up with a zero zero draw i would be surprised if that happens but <laughs> for what these two teams bring to the table um so that that's what i'm most curious to see against toronto is hey can we replicate what we did at uh at vancouver where we set the tone where we're the team that is the uh, aggressor um, and from that, can we break the seal, get it past Sean Johnson, and put some pressure? Because that's probably the other thing that is maybe a little premature in my, my you know, oh, we're going to potentially get as high as three or third or fourth. Like, I'm not saying we're, we're to that level quite yet, but we haven't seen this team face adversity. Yeah. We haven't seen us uh, have to claw back into a game and fight back when you're down a goal. Um, so, so that's what I'm curious yeah. to see is if we end up having some of those moments where, hey, do we end up picking up a red card? Do we end up, you know, being behind? Do we have a call that goes against us in the box or something like that? Yeah. The um, reaction to adversity. Yeah, th- yeah, those moments are going to come, um, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if that happens on this road trip, um, and, and against Toronto. That's what we've got to see is can, can we break the seal uh, and, and make things interesting? For sure, and uh, I forgot who mentioned it. it might have been you actually. You know, like, I mean, winning at home is the most important thing. When you go away, it's like pulling points, right? Like you can, a point of Vancouver, sure, three would have been great, but we got one, mm-hmm. right? Toronto, all right, three will be great, but if we can, if we can grab one, especially like the, it doesn't get talked enough about how much like the traveling. That's it's a, 
that makes a big difference, right? When you're playing in England or in Scotland or these, where what the furthest game is a couple hours away at yeah. most, like you're traveling to different time zones. Like a lot of this takes a takes a big factor. And if you can pull points away, especially from Canadian teams, I feel like you're already on the up to get the season going. Yeah. Oh, and for the listeners, look look at me here, okay? <laughs> for, for the listeners at MLS, you only need to have like three or four road wins to make the postseason and be a dangerous team. Three or four out of 17. Like, don't be discouraged if there's some losses early on in the year on the road. Like, and and that's why it's so huge when those early season road wins do happen. Yeah. Is because it can set that tone and you only need to hit that three or four mark. Um, and, and I think at Toronto is going to be a really good opportunity for, for us to get one of those Ws. Yeah, for sure. And like you mentioned, it, the positive start is what I'm sticking with, right? I mean... I had four points, you know, out of the next six games, right? So we're already yeah. at where I feel like we were because it's a tough stretch to start yeah. off the season. And, I mean, Dean has taken this, and he's he's riding along really well, in my opinion. Because after this, we've got Nashville, we've got Columbus, we've got Cincinnati, right? So those are going to be some very, very tough games that we head into. Um, but I, like we mentioned, right, I mean, it's, It'll be an interesting game this Saturday. What we'll, we'll finish it off with some score predictions for this game. I'll start off with you, Vaughn, since you're our guest. Oh man, I'm I'm gonna go two nothing us two on the road. Charlotte. Wow, that, <laughs> that would be a that would be a hell of a result. Yeah, that, that would that, that I mean, will I be. Think that would be that would be. Um, you know what? I don't know. Like something about Vaughn's. He's kind of like yeah. Melanda. He just has yeah. this air of positivity yeah. and quiet confidence yeah. to him now. I drank yeah. all the Kool Aid yeah. before I came. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. who knows? Yeah, it I was like, we we probably need some of that yeah. Kool Aid. I, I was gonna say he almost feels like he's had a conversation with like Tesho Akindele recently. Just like those positive vibes, like he yeah. talked about when he was on our show last year. Um, I think I think Toronto's gonna gonna bring it i mean i think they should they're gonna feel pretty motivated they went on the road to cincinnati and got a clean sheet and a nil nil draw they went on the road to new england and got a clean sheet and a win i mean i don't know how much more motivated you could be than beating two of the top teams or getting a result in the, on the road against two of the top teams in the east so i think they're gonna be very motivated and feel confident going into this game charlotte same way i think it's gonna be uh, a, a grudge match i think there's gonna be uh, some scrap involved as well, similar to like how it was in Vancouver. There's going to be some ugly play. I think about a one-one result is is fair. In this yeah, well. and I think something that you can take account to in a team like Toronto, right? Like, even if they're not playing well, they got a guy like Insigne that could just mm -hmm. make the difference. Yeah. Right. Which, when I look at our club, who is there's not really one player that you could say, okay, this guy will make the difference. Yeah. Right. So I'm actually I'm gonna go for a two-one win, Charlotte. Yeah. So. Um, I had him pulling a point in Vancouver and a win in Toronto, and so uh, I'm I'm gonna drink some of that Kool Aid that Bond <laughs> drinking, and hopefully I, I really I really want to see Copetti get a goal right because yeah, he does a I lot see. of things well, but you know what the fan base focuses on, and to be fair, right, like if you're a DP striker, you got to be making those th these types of goals, right, and so um, it doesn't help that you see like Swiderski score a 1v1 for <laughs> Las Veronas, right? So now you got something more to pile on. But with that said, Vaughn, where can we find you at, my man? Uh, at VI Pullman on socials. Uh, and I'm the nomadic podcaster. I'm, I'm jumping around. I'll be somewhere. You summer. are. Where do you think you've been on the most? Mint City? Oh, yeah. I think I've been on Mint City Soccer Show the most by now. Yeah. Okay. Nice. You, you got to change that, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we got to bring you in more often. Now that we have four seats. <laughs> Brian? Yeah, y'all can find me on Twitter at BAM. BAM. Mauer Media. <laughs> and you can also, uh, you can find all my written content at topbin90.com. And um, me and Blake are recording our newest episode of Dropping Points. You can uh, check out that show on Spotify as well. Yeah, for sure. Shout outs to you too. They, um, MLS has you as one of like the, I don't even know what it's called, Pool Insiders. The Pool yeah. Reporter. Pool Reporter, yeah. yeah. That, was, that made my day. That's no, awesome, bro. That I mean, you do a lot of great work for yeah. us so and for the Dropping Points show, too. So we appreciate you, man. Thank you for all that you do. Vaughn, man, it's always a pleasure to have you guys. It's like, to me, when I have both of you on, it's like Xavi and Iniesta, just the brains, <laughs> you know, making the team tick, right? So I appreciate both of you. Uh, you guys know Jorge Gonzalez. Our channels are at Top Bin 90 everywhere. Thank you, guys. Another episode wrapped up. Get! <laughs>